Hey, I'm Rick. I'm the lead pastor here at Autumn Ridge Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in to our YouTube channel and participating in our most recent message series, The Great Divide. In this message series, we're trying to tackle some of the big questions that both believers and non-believers are asking. And there's a tremendous resource that we've been using, and we want to make sure that you're aware of it as well. It's a book by Pastor Tim Keller. It's called The Reason for God. We're going to be referring to things from this book, and we just think it's helpful uh, for everyone who's listening uh, to grab this book, to read through it. Whether you're exploring faith and you're trying to figure out if Jesus is someone you want to trust, or you are a devoted follower of Jesus and you have questions that you're still wrestling through, or you want to better be able to answer those questions for people that you care about, I think you're going to find this book to be a tremendous resource. Again, thanks for joining us digitally. We hope you enjoy this message. would we bother to go back to a book that was written 2,600 years ago in order to, to do that? When you think who wrote that book, they were ignorant, they were desert-dwelling scribes. When we're talking about moral philosophy, when we're talking about the origin of the cosmos, when we're talking about the origin of life, when we're talking about why, why we all exist, there is no reason whatever. Once again, I come back to the point, there is nothing special about the Bible. Yes. There's nothing special about the Bible. If you don't recognize the voice that you heard in that video, it's not Sam Harris this week. Today, it's Richard Dawkins. And if you aren't familiar with who Richard Dawkins is, uh, he's a world-renowned evolutionary biologist. For many years, he was a professor at Oxford. He's a best-selling author, and he's an outspoken critic of religion in general and Christianity in particular. And regardless of what you may or may not think about Richard Dawkins, he never leaves room for doubt about what he thinks, does he? I mean, he made it clear. If you want to be a reasonable person, an intelligent person, you plant yourself on this mountain right over here. If you want to be the kind of person who takes the Bible seriously as a source of historical and moral and spiritual truth, you plant yourself over here. You cannot be a person who takes reason seriously and a person who takes the Bible seriously. Those two positions are irreconcilable. Maybe you laugh at that. Maybe you're offended by that. Maybe you're convinced of that, or maybe you're growing more convinced of that position. Wherever you're coming from today, my question is, how do you respond to that? And to be clear, this is our question. Are there good reasons for why we should take the Bible seriously? This is one of those questions, especially when we're talking to church on a Sunday morning. This is one of those questions a lot of us, maybe all of us, have some sort of emotional response to. How you feel is important, and yet it's irrelevant to answering this question. Your parents, your family of origin, the culture, the, the geographic location out of which you were produced, they all coalesce to give us an answer to this question, and yet all of those factors, as important as they are, they are not relevant to answering this question. And I bet even if it's very different from mine, I bet that you have an answer that you want to be true to this question. And as important as it is, what you and I think, what you and I desire, our desires are important and yet they're irrelevant to answering this question. There's a very important set of instructions that have had a profound impact on the people of this church. And regardless of where you're coming from today, whether you're in the room or you're joining us online, I want to invite you to let the heart behind these instructions have a profound impact on how you respond to this question. In the New Testament, one of the guys who knew Jesus personally was a guy named Peter. He wrote a couple of letters, and one of them is called First Peter. He wrote this, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Right off the bat, he gives us a reason to take the Bible seriously. And if you're a person who you're struggling to, you're just not sure if you trust Jesus yet, or you got some serious questions and some doubts, you're not ready to trust the Bible yet, what I'm going to say next is going to feel like circular reasoning. I just, just let me acknowledge that. 
I'm not being circular, but it might feel that way. And so I'm just going to ask you, would you hang in there with me and not use that as an excuse to pull the ejection handle? I want to start with this right here, revere Christ as Lord. If you're a note taker, I want to invite you to write this down. When you revere who a person is, you also revere what that person says. That just makes sense, right? You don't even have to have any spiritual or religious convictions to acknowledge that. This is true for all people, for all of time. When you revere who a person is, you also revere what that person says. I don't know if you know who this guy is, James Emery White. He's a pastor. Uh, he's a best-selling author. He used to be the president of Gordon-Conwell Seminary. I want you to hear today how he frames this discussion. He says, it would be a little weird to say, Jesus, I've come to you for my eternity to save me from my sins. I'm banking all of eternity on you, and I believe you are God himself in human form who came to earth. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead, but this book of yours, I can't buy into it. I don't believe you have the power to set aside a collection of writings for your followers. I think he's right. That would be a weird position. There is a great divide between people who take the Bible seriously and people who don't. But there can also be a great divide inside of people individually. There are people who love Jesus who are devoted to Jesus, who revere Jesus, but are unsure, who doubt that there are good reasons to fully trust the Bible as God's word to us. And I hope we can be vulnerable. I hope we can be real here today. I know that I'm describing people who attend Autumn Ridge Church on a regular basis. I know because some of us have had conversations about this. And what I want to suggest today is that position of trying to revere Jesus and and not being sure about his word, the best word to describe that is not weird. I think the better word is it's disorienting. How do you revere Jesus and have a lifestyle that shows that you revere Jesus and at the same time really doubt the Bible? Because on a very practical level, if we don't trust the Bible, if, if we doubt it, then practically speaking with our, with our lifestyle and our lifestyle choices, we're, we're going to reject it. And so I want to try and put a fine point on it. How do you revere Jesus and at the same time doubt and or reject what the Bible has to say about what to do with our money? How do you revere Jesus and at the same time doubt or, or reject what the Bible has to say about loving people, even people whose ideologies we might despise or even hate? How do you revere Jesus and at the same time, seriously doubt or reject what the Bible has to say about sexuality, about lust, about greed, and about pride? How do you revere Jesus and at the same time, seriously doubt or reject what the Bible has to say about gentleness? And kind of phrasing it this way, some of you guys might feel like I'm not being very gentle with you now, and that's not really my intent. What I'm trying to do is acknowledge that this can be disorienting. And what I'm going to say next does nothing to prove or demonstrate that the Bible is trustworthy. What I'm going to say next does nothing to demonstrate the Bible is trustworthy. It simply exposes, if it's not, we have a major problem. If God has not given us a set of instructions from him to us, if we can't know his word, if we don't have that, none of us are following Jesus. We're following ourselves or we're following the viewpoints of somebody else. So when it comes to today's question, are there any good reasons for taking the Bible seriously? What is your response to that? In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. If you're a person who trusts the Bible as God's word, like I do, Hear me on this. It's not enough to simply say, well, the Bible says. That might be helpful to someone who already trusts it as God's word, but it's not helpful to anyone who's asking you, but why do you trust it as God's word? What's the reason that convinced you? If we just say, well, the Bible says, we're sidestepping. We're ignoring on purpose their question. And call me crazy. I just think it's disrespectful to intentionally ignore someone's question. And it may not be violent, but it certainly isn't gentle if on purpose we ignore and sidestep someone's question. In the first week of this series, 
I said this, I want to remind you of it. Belief without good reasons is being gullible. Disbelief without good reasons is being arbitrary. If you haven't taken time to really process this, if you haven't given yourself time to really wrestle this down, it doesn't matter if you're devoted or a doubter, things about this message today is going to feel like sand in your shorts. It will agitate you. But that could be a good thing. It's a good thing if it motivates you to identify what are your reasons for belief. Or if it motivates you to identify what are your reasons for disbelief. But that's only the first step. And the second step is this. Now to evaluate the reasonableness. The reasonableness of those reasons for belief or disbelief. Every single one of us, we've already picked a foundation on which we're building our life. For the rest of our life, we're going to keep building on that foundation that we chose. It doesn't matter what your spiritual beliefs are. are, are. We've all done that. And so there is a challenge, an urgent challenge in front of every single one of us, and it's this. Will you pick the foundation for your life based on how reliable it is or by how preferable it is? Those are not the same thing. And I'm not going to make any assumptions about you. If you're watching online, I'm not making assumptions about you. I do want to share some of my observations. Building your life based on this is easy. Building your life based on this is hard. This is easy because it doesn't require any effort. It just comes natural. But if we're going to build our life based on a reliable foundation, that means we have to do hard work ahead of time. We got to study. We got to scrutinize ahead of time. We got to know why is it that we trust what we trust? Why is it that we believe what we believe? And it's hard work, but it's worthwhile because of what is at stake? What's on the line? And I want to share with you something that Jesus said. And even if you're a person, you're not sure if you trust Jesus or you're not ready to trust the Bible, I think we can all see the wisdom in what Jesus had to say. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. If we wait until times of adversity, if we wait until times of difficulty, if we wait until we experience suffering to find out if we've built our lives on a reliable foundation, we have waited too late. And if you're thinking this or you have someone in your life that you care about and they're asking this question and they're saying, yeah, but I hear what you're saying and there's wisdom in that, but I just don't know if I can trust Jesus. I don't know that I'm ready to trust God's word. I hear that. And maybe you're asking this question. Maybe you're asking a question like we heard in the video. Why would I trust a book that's so old written by ignorant desert-dwelling scribes? That's how Richard Dawkins asked the question. If you're asking that question, I'm glad you're here. But as a friend, if this is your question, I want to encourage you to rephrase it. Don't say this question out loud. Because at best, it's condescending, and at worst, it's a little bit racist. Is it your position? If this is your question, is it your position that you only trust in things that have not been proven, that have not withstood the test of time. How does it follow that the passage of time makes something less true or less trustworthy? How does it follow that the region of the world from which something comes or the people group who first wrote it down makes it less true and less trustworthy? How does that follow? But I'm in a room of kind, reasonable people. You guys aren't condescending or a little bit racist. You're much more reasonable. Maybe there are people in the room who are asking this kind of question. Maybe somebody who you care about is asking the question this way. Do I have to believe the Bible is the actual word of God in order to take it seriously? What do you think? What do you think the answer is to that? The answer is no. No. You don't have to believe something in order to take it seriously. I want to ask you this question. How could someone ever reasonably come to the conclusion that the Bible really is God's word if they didn't first read it, study it, scrutinize it, take it seriously to find out what the good reasons are? This summer, my wife and I are going to celebrate being married for 23 years. And uh, we were very young when we got together. I was 20 when we got engaged. She was 19. 
It was a whirlwind romance. We didn't even date for three months when we got engaged. And then we were married before we had known each other a full year. And now that I have a daughter who's 18 and a freshman in college, I'm freaked out by my own story. It's going to just take it slow. Just take it slow. But when you know, you know, right? Maybe not. It was about five years ago, my kids announced to me, hey, dad, did you know when you and mom got engaged, she wasn't even sure if she wanted to marry you? I was like, what? Hold up, what? Apparently, my wife wasn't sure that I was the one for her, and it wasn't until about a month before the wedding day that she decided she was all in. Now, keep in mind, she never told me. She did tell our kids. So I went and I was like, babe, is this true? And she said, well, I wasn't sure that I loved you. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, okay. She said, I wasn't sure that I loved you. I didn't even know if I wanted to get married yet. I just knew I wasn't ready to break up. <laughs> Ladies, is this what you do? Is this normal? And so she said, I just figured I'd use our period of our engagement to kind of get those questions answered. You know what she was doing? She was using the period of our engagement to take me seriously, to scrutinize me, to, to evaluate what she really thought about me before she decided she was going to anchor her life to my life. And now we've been married almost 23 years. I think she's all in. I should probably ask the kids. <laughs> you don't have to be convinced today that the Bible really is God's word to take it seriously. You can study it. You can evaluate it. You can scrutinize it. I want to give you permission to use the Heather Henderson engagement plan. <laughs> Take it seriously. Study it. Scrutinize it. Find out what are the reasons. What are the reasons to trust it as God's word to us? In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And week one of this series, I said, it's not my job to convince you. It's my job to share with you what convinced me. It is not your responsibility to convince people of what you believe. It is your responsibility to be able to share with others and to talk about with others what it was that convinced you. And so today I'm going to do that. Today I'm going to share with you what it is that convinced me this is no ordinary book, that there's something special about the Bible, that there are good reasons to trust it as reliable, that it is God's word to us. Now, I'm going to skip over eyewitness evidence and manuscript and some textual evidence. I want to encourage you to read Tim Keller's book, A Reason for God, if you want more of that. Back in September, I did a, uh, one of the messages in the sacred series. I, I laid, a case, uh, for, laid out a case for the reliability of the New Testament. Today, I'm going to give you a different batch of evidences or reasons that have convinced me. We're going to take a bit of a different approach. Number one, the Bible is reliable historically and supported archaeologically. My wife likes to say inside of every man, there's a junior high boy. I'm going to prove her right right now, at least with me. I don't know if there's anybody else out there who has a favorite archaeological discovery. Any other nerds in the room? Anybody have a favorite archaeological discovery? I'm going to share with you mine. It's this. It's a toilet. <laughs> toilet found in 3,000-year-old shrine verifies Bible stories against idol worship. If you're wondering, what in the world are we talking about? We got to go to 2 Kings chapter 10. This is in the Old Testament. It talks about how uh, they t tore down places of idol worship so they could turn back and trust to God. They demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal, and people have used it for a latrine to this day. Now, I want to spend more time than we have to talk about this, because I think it's amazing. Not only did they tear down places of idol worship, deconstruct the temple, they put a toilet on it. And this is like no average toilet. This took some serious work. Check out this bad boy. Some serious business went into that one, so you could do your business. I, I'm, I'm astounded by that. The, the times of Israel, when, they, when this was discovered, this is how the times of Israel uh, wrote about this discovery. Iron Age toilet is evident, Judean king dumped on the gods. <laughs> Woo! I love it. Now, I'm giving you just one example of an archaeological uh, find that supports what we read in the Bible. This is, this is just one of many, and I think this is a fun one. But there are literally thousands upon thousands of archaeological discoveries that continually support what we read in God's Word. 
I don't expect you to know who Nelson Gluck is or was. He was a rabbi. He was a professor in academia. He was an archaeologist. He is remembered for saying this. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted or ever contradicted or disproven a biblical reference. It's not, and this, is, this statement is just as true as it's ever been. It's not that archaeology mostly lines up with the Bible. It's that archaeological discoveries never contradict what we read in the Bible. If they were just a bunch of ignorant, desert-dwelling scribes, how do you explain that? We're talking about thousands upon thousands of discoveries. Now, maybe you're thinking, maybe somebody would say, well, so what? They got history right. That doesn't mean they're, they were right. Biblical writers were correct in, in matters of moral and spiritual truth. Well, that's fair. Would it help if there was some evidence that indicated that there's supernatural origin to the writing of the Bible? Like, if God really did communicate his word to human authors and they wrote it down, the supernatural message and a document that was passed on over the centuries, what kind of evidence would support that? What would it take to, to demonstrate that that might be the case? I don't know what it, what it would be that would convince you. Let me share with you some things that would go a long way to convince me. If people could do that, if they claim to be speaking for God, if they could accurately talk about future events, about things that there's no way they could have known, and they absolutely get it right, that would go a long way with me. Now, I'm not talking about just kind of like general uh, predictions. Like, I'm not going to be convinced that you have a direct access to God, and he's given you information of two months ago, you tell me, you know what, Tom Brady's probably going to come out of retirement. Yeah, we know. We all saw that coming. Another NFL season with Tom Brady. Yay. I need something more compelling than that. The hyper accuracy of biblical prophecy demands an explanation. Back in December, in our Christmas message series, I introduced the work of a guy named Peter Stoner. Uh, he was a scientist and a mathematician. He wanted to calculate what are the odds that one person, what are the odds that Jesus could fulfill all the Old Testament promises or the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah? And so he and his students worked on it together, and they calculated that the odds of one person being able to fulfill all the Old Testament predictions about the coming Messiah was 1 in 10 to the 157th power. This is what that number looks like. I think that's impressive, but that doesn't mean that you're impressed, and that's okay. Because maybe you're saying, Rick, it would be great if you could really give me something specific. Like, what is something that's undeniable in the way that the Bible predicted something in the future that everybody recognizes? Yeah, they got it right. Tuesday nights has become one of my favorite nights of the week. Every Tuesday, I get to have dinner and do a Bible study with some of my friends over at Next Chapter of Ministries. And right now, we're studying the Old Testament book of Daniel. And Daniel presents a major problem for scholars who want to deny it as a serious book. The Old Testament book of Daniel presents major problems for scholars who want to deny that there's any supernatural origin, who they just want to understand it through natural explanations because Daniel is hyper accurate to a stunning degree with the prophecies that he gets right in a way that defies coincidence. If you haven't read Daniel chapter two in a while, I want you to go back and read Daniel chapter two maybe this week. In Daniel chapter two, he interprets a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had about a statue. And Daniel says that statue represents something, and it represents the rise and fall of some major kingdoms. And this is what Daniel was talking about. The statue had a head of gold that represented Babylon. The statue had chest and arms of silver that represented Medo-Persia. Daniel was alive for the end of Babylon and in the beginning of Medo-Persia. It had a belly and thighs of bronze that represented Greece, and you see the years for the Greek empire. The statue had legs and feet of iron and clay that represented Rome, which lasted over a little over 500 years. Religious scholars and irreligious scholars alike all agree, Daniel got this 100% right. He's hyper accurate. It's just taken as a given. This is absolutely right. He's so right that many scholars say, well, there's no way that Daniel was written early. It had to be written sometime after this date because they need a natural explanation for how Daniel got all of this right. And their position is that the book of Daniel is a fraud. He's pretending to be written up here. He had to be written down here because they need a natural explanation for it. 
The first person to ever recognize the problem of how accurate Daniel is was a guy named Porphyry. Porphyry was a philosopher in the third century AD. He was an outspoken critic of Christianity and the Bible. And he was the first person to recognize it's so accurate, he demanded that it had to be written much later. And we know, check this out, we know what Porphyry thought, we know what he wrote, because Christian theologians and historians wrote down his critique of Christianity. Isn't that fascinating? Christian historians and theologians did not suppress opposing viewpoints. They copied them, they spread them, and included their arguments for why they thought those critiques were wrong or why they fell short. It's one of many reasons that demonstrates why Christianity is one of the most open and transparent worldviews in human history. Well, this is how we know that Porphyry got it wrong and how many other scholars got it wrong. Daniel is supported archaeologically, supports him as being reliable in the people and the events that he described. And one of the ways we know that is this discovery right here. You guys recognize this, right? You're thinking, that's the Nabonidus cylinder. You're correct. That's the Nabonidus cylinder. This was discovered in a riverbed in 1854, 168 years ago. Hang on to that. In Daniel chapter 5, Daniel claims that there was a ruler in Babylon named Belshazzar. Until 1854, when this was discovered, Belshazzar's name was lost to history. The book of Daniel was the, only, was the only place in all of human history that said that there was a guy in Babylon named Belshazzar. In 1854, when this was discovered, people translated the cylinder of Nabonidus. They, they read that there was a monarch in Babylon named Belshazzar. Before 1854, scholars made fun of the Bible. Before 1854, there were books written trying to make fun of Daniel, that he's just making stuff up. It wasn't until 168 years ago that we found evidence that said, no, Daniel was right. If, he, if it was really written hundreds of years later, how would Daniel know that? Another reason that we could be confident that Daniel really was written early because he gets the royal kind of governmental Persian language right and this is the kind of terminology that, um, that went away long before the second century BC. And to try and put in perspective how stunning that is, that'd be like you and me trying to write an accurate history of King Philip IV, King of Spain, and we get all the governmental techno- uh, terminology right in the Spanish of the day, but we don't have a library, we don't have history books, we don't have newspapers, and we don't have Wikipedia. You think you could do that? You feeling confident? Here's another reason we know that Daniel had to be written early. He gets it right that the Babylonians used fire for capital punishment, but that switched to using lions for capital punishment during the reign of the Medo-Persians. If he wrote hundreds of years later, how would he know that? Here's the kicker. Here's the devastating piece of evidence for people who doubt the early authorship of Daniel. It's one of the most profound discoveries in human history. It's the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in the late 1940s. It proves that Daniel was already written and long viewed as Scripture long before the second century B.C. The language that Daniel uses is evidence that it was written early. Archaeology supports that Daniel was absolutely right in the kind of events he describes. The Dead Sea Scrolls proves that Daniel was written early. So what's your explanation? How do you explain the hyper-accuracy of the prophecy that you find in the book of Daniel? It's easy to say, there's nothing special about the Bible. That's the nature of propaganda, easily said, easily spread. But the agenda behind propaganda is never truth. The agenda behind propaganda is the preservation and the protection of preferences. Our service today, basically an hour long. I only have a short amount of time to give you just a snapshot of some of the stunning evidences for why we can trust the Bible and take it seriously. If you want to know a little bit more, you can access the sermon notes at autumnridge.church, and I include some other references for you to study if if you would like that. But what I hope is beginning to, to come into view for us is our series thesis Faith is not in competition with reason. It's a consequence of reason, trusting in what is true. In the New Testament, there's a guy named John. 
And John was one of the guys who knew Jesus best. There are probably very few people who knew Jesus better than John. Uh, If Jesus had a best friend, it probably was John. John was an eyewitness to many of the major events in Jesus' life. He was there and watched Jesus be crucified. He had many personal experiences and encounters with Jesus after the resurrection. And at great cost and great pain to himself, John passed along the message of Jesus. What's great benefit to us was great cost to him. You cannot casually dismiss somebody like that. This is how John wrote about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word. He is human and divine. And that not only describes Jesus, that also describes Scripture. It is both human and divine in its origin. And the way, believe it or not, the way that we read about Jesus interacting with people is the exact same way that we can expect the Word to interact with us. Just three chapters later, in John chapter 4, we read about an exchange that Jesus had with an unnamed woman. We simply know her as the woman at the well. I would encourage you, go read John chapter 4. And Jesus has this encounter with this woman and he knows her and he discloses information about her that there's no way that that could be explained unless he is divine. And she ran off from this encounter with Jesus. She ran back to her town and basically preached a gospel sermon. She proclaimed to the women and to the men in her village about this guy who she was convinced was God in the flesh, and she invited them to come and check him out for themselves. And this is how John writes about a part of that. He says this, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony, and this was a big part of her testimony. He told me everything I ever did. The word knew her, The Word diagnosed her. The Word knew her better than she knew herself. And Jesus just kept coming with an unedited message of grace. How could she not take the Word seriously? And because she talked about it, an entire town was transformed. Because she talked about it, generations would be transformed. And if you're the kind of person you don't geek out on archaeology and history, that's totally okay. But I want to invite you to geek out on this. It is a special book. It is no ordinary book. Not only do we read the Word, the Word reads us. I want to close with this thought. I read the Bible seriously because it reads me meticulously. This is one of the things that's convinced me that this really is God's Word. I can't tell you how many times it has laid bare I mean, it has just laid bare my deep down insecurities and fears that I thought I had kept hidden. The Bible has this uncanny ability to expose my motivations. It's like, it's like it understands my motivations better than I do. Like it understands me better than I know myself. And it just keeps coming with this unedited, unflinching, unfiltered message of grace. And in its pages, I have found life and joy, and wisdom. And my life is an example of promises that are made in God's word are promises kept. And there are a mountain of reasons that you can know and that you could study for why to take it seriously, but all of that counts for nothing if we don't experience it personally. So I want to invite you to read it, to study it, to scrutinize it, take it seriously, and see where that takes you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are incredibly kind and patient. You are good. And you have made yourself knowable through many things and especially through your word and you have protected it in a way that we can know it. We can know you and we could know Jesus. We could know the story of the gospel because of our high confidence in your word. God, I pray that you would give us greater confidence and that you would use us to be people who revere Jesus, 
And we know what it means to do that because of what we read in your word. And we are happy ambassadors who joyfully share it with others. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.